I went to my family physician who was fairly new out of medical school, and he did go over a little bit of diet, unlike a lot of them do, but it was throw away the real butter, don't eat eggs, eat by the egg whites in cartons, no decent meat. So it was like chicken breast with no skin. And I did that for a year and I had my blood drawn. I was like, what is that inside there? Because you could see the blood, but then it looked like Crisco. She says, oh, that's just fat. And I was like, what the heck? A week later, I saw him and he said, your triglycerides are a thousand at least. That's as high as our meter goes at the time. But he did tell me that I was going to be diabetic. I was over 300 pounds and I was 20. Hypertension, fatty liver disease is just off the charts in these younger people and non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver, all kinds of things that are definitely metabolically related. The other change that I have seen is the sheer number of type 3 diabetes, the dementia and Alzheimer's. Those numbers are just skyrocketing and younger and younger. All right, welcome. We have with us today, Laura, who's going to be sharing the success story with us. Laura, would you maybe share a little bit about your background for us and we'll get started? Sure. I've been a nurse for over 21 years. I started out eventually doing keto before it was a thing in 91 mm. and then turned carnivore just a little over four years ago. And so I integrate that into my current practice with my patients, changing their lifestyles. So that's where I come from. What kind of nursing have you done? I have done cardiac cath lab, emergency room, CVU, ICU, med surge, home health, nursing home. Okay. So you've done the gamut for sure. And your current, yes. you said with your current, the current people you deal with, are you doing something outside of that now? So I'm doing home health, but it is for a, um, um, it's a health department. So it's a county health department. So we're pretty autonomous. Okay. In, what, what part what of the do. world, what part of the world are you in, if you don't mind? I am in the state of Illinois, nowhere near Chicago. <laughs> I lived in Illinois briefly when I was a kid. I lived in Chicago Heights, so near Chicago back when I was about, I don't know, yeah. four, five, six years old, something like that. Okay, so you keto in 91, obviously that's a while ago. That was back in the still, I think Atkins might have even still been alive back then. And so that was that, what was the desire to do that back way back then? When I was 19, I had went to my family physician who was fairly new out of medical school. And he did go over a little bit of diet, unlike a lot of them do, but it was you need to eat country crock, throw away the real butter, don't eat eggs, eat by the egg whites in cartons, mm -hmm. no decent meat. So it was like chicken breast with no skin. And I did that for a year and I had my blood drawn. And when the lady drew my blood and they have you look at your name on the, the label, I was like, what is that inside there? Because you could see the blood, but then it looked like Crisco, little pieces of Crisco in there. And she says, oh, that's just fat. And I was like, what the heck? So a week later, I saw him and he said, your triglycerides are a thousand at least. That's as high as our meter goes at the time. I don't believe they were doing hemoglobin A1Cs at the time because I don't recall them talking about that. But he did tell me that I was going to be diabetic. I was over 300 pounds and I was 20. Yeah. Okay. So he handed me a script back in the paper script days and it was for Lipitor. That was fairly new. I think it came out in 87 and this was 91. And I just remember I said to him, how long am I going to be taking this medicine? How long will it take to help? And he said, well, you're going to take it for the rest of your life. Um, and that drove me to my local library where I lived in Iowa at the time. And I actually was able, it was a very old library. And I took all the medical journals and books I could find. Most of them were from like the 1850s through 1910. And I read them from cover to cover. And what I saw, it, it just broke my heart because I was like, this is the opposite of everything we're being told. So that's where my journey to keto started. I just threw away everything white in my house. Okay. So yeah, it's interesting because yeah, back in the 90s was when that low fat thing was really going hard. We were really, this was all the low fat everything but that's when the snack i think the snack was i don't remember when they came out and that was the, one of the sort of emblems of, of the low fat days but but you were 300 pounds when you're 20 i said how, how, what, what were you doing back then what was your diet like to get you there do you think 
It was the standard American diet with low fat, the salad dressings that said low fat, which now that you read them, it's, yeah, but that was higher sugar. It was seed oils. It was Doritos because that was on their diet. So it was basically pizza, hamburgers with the bun, French fries, just the normal stuff that the 19, 20 year olds eat, especially when you first move out of mom's house and you don't have to follow their dietary guidelines anymore. You make up your own. Um, but I followed the diet he sent me. Okay. But like I said, you left your mom's house. Did you gain a lot of weight immediately when you left home or was that, how did that work? I, I was about two. Yeah. I was 240 pounds when I graduated high school and I started gaining that weight in about 84. So my freshman year of high school, I really, I don't, I wasn't real sedentary. I was an outdoors person. I've always hunted fish. I live right there on the river. I've always been somebody that played with all the boys in the neighborhood because I lived in an all boy neighborhood, climbing trees, doing things like that. And I think my freshman year, I probably laid off of that being out with the guys as much. And MTV came out 1984. So it was sit down and watch MTV eat Doritos and continue to get sicker. Do you have in your family, was there other people like parents obesity or anything like that? Or was it, were you the first generation? Yeah. Yeah. So my mother and my half brother are obese, 280 to 320 pounds, cardiac history. My dad died at 40 cardiac issues and the whole family basically was just lots of, of cardiac issues and not like long-term hypertension, but like here today, gone tomorrow of a massive heart attack. It just runs in the family. But yeah, basically first degree relatives, just one one generation before me of obesity. Okay. And obviously spending time in the CC cardiac care units and things like that, you've seen a lot of heart disease. And so you went this on this no white sort of ketogenic diet relatively young. Did it work for you? It absolutely did. So in nine months, I lost well over 150 pounds very quickly, too quickly, actually, because then you have the loose skin. Uh, I went back and had my blood work done again. And the main thing I was worried about, I didn't care about all the other numbers. I didn't understand them yet. I hadn't went to nursing school was I wanted to know my triglycerides and being off of those foods for the nine months, including liquid candy known as pop. I went down to 33 on my triglycerides. Wow. And, thousand uh, to th over a thousand to 33. Yeah. What did the yeah. doctor say at that time? He did this. My Lipitor did such a good job. Were you were you taking the Lipitor at the time? No, sir. Okay. I actually had actually I, I had the discussion with him. I said, no, I didn't take your prescription. That was still the paper script days. So I handed it back to him. And I truly meant this because I was brought up that the doctors are the next thing to God. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at him and I was brokenhearted. I just said, I didn't take your medication. I went back and ate closer to my grandparents the way they did things. And I changed what I put in my body and I healed myself. And it's a shame that you should know more about how my body works than I had to go out and learn. And he says, you're still, he was happy with my numbers until I told him how I got there. And then he was like, well, you're just going to die a fat ASS. And I was like, but after, so you'd already I lost, him. after you'd already lost 150 pounds, he said that. Yes. Because you would have been. Yes, he pretty, did. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Talk about bedside yeah. manner. Goodness. <laughs> I've seen some yeah, side, so over I, the years. I've seen some bad behavior in doctors, but that's pretty. That's unfortunate for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But with my personality, it, I'm glad he did it now. It would never fly with me now. I'm going to be 53. I wouldn't tolerate that. But I'm glad that he did that at that age because I was at that cusp where was I going to follow recommendations of what everybody else said, or was I going to track on my own and find what worked for me? And so it actually pushed me to be like, I I'm going to go out and figure this out on my own. Okay. So you lost the weight, brought your triglycerides down. I don't know what your cholesterol numbers, who knows? I don't know what, what they were. Maybe you remember from back then. How, so was it sustainable for you? Because one, one of the biggest criticisms is it's not sustainable. You can't do a ketogenic. Did you maintain that for the next 20 some years or what happened? I basically, I did keto for another, I did it up to 28 years at about the 26 year mark is when the keto craze really came into the market. So 
keto snacks, try to make everything look and taste exactly like what you remember your cheesecake tasting. That's when I really started noticing issues of like cystic acne. I had horrible cystic acne, was getting close to menopause and I could tell things were slowing down there. I was starting to get joint pain, inflammation in my joints, and my family has osteoarthritis. My mother has had about every joint replaced, and I just was like, what is happening? And I actually saw your interview on Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. The first one, I I guess it was the first one, not the second one. Yeah, 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 your first one. Yep, I've seen them both, but yeah, I saw the first one, and I was like, my my dad was three-quarters Cherokee Indian, and and they didn't run around the country following broccoli and cornfields. They were following the herds. And so I thought this kind of makes sense because I've always been lactose intolerant because of Cherokee. I think a lot of Indian nations have that. And so I was like, yep, I'm just going to jump in and see what we can do. If you, oh, I was going to ask the cystic acne, you said it was in the keto. Did you start indulging in those keto products? Do you think that was a, was part of the problem? Absolutely. Yes, I started doing that. And I also started using like I even grew my own stevia. I am a gardener canner. And so I started growing my own stevia, peppermint, spearmint, things like that, and was integrating the it's not really a fake sugar, but it's a sugar alternatives. And I really think that had a lot to do with it. Because once I cut those out, the first thing that went away was anxiety, depression, cystic acne, and then the pain was just gone. Let me go back to, you had all this nursing career in the various different departments and different capacities, and you're doing this ketogenic diet and probably seeing people that weren't doing that type of diet and and having all, particularly in the cardiac care unit. Did you ever think about, or did you ever get a chance to share, hey, dietary advice with your patients? Yes. With every one of my patients that was willing to sit there, and most of them had to sit for two hours after their heart cath, so they had to listen to a little bit. I actually made up a cookbook of just handwritten out ketogenic, ketovore type meal plans and recipes. And I would actually give them out to the patients and go over things that they could do. And that eating bacon grease and butter and lard and and things like that was absolutely necessary. So I was able to integrate that in. And the doctors and cardiologists that I work with they were, they were like, okay, yeah, you can go with whatever you want with them. We're still going to throw them on a statin and metformin. All right. How receptive were somebody's laying? I guess somebody's laying there just had a heart attack. They're probably like, like maybe considering where their life is going. Maybe you had some people that were unwilling to listen, but how, how you probably don't get long-term follow-up, I would imagine, I, I would assume, correct? Uh, On some, I actually did because I worked in the cath lab for over five years. So one of my first patients I went over with was a a truck driver, a long over the road truck driver. And he says, I can't eat keto on the road. And I was like, sure you can. And I went over some basic things he could do, stay to the outer aisles of the grocery store, things like that. And he lost 180 pounds and was able to reverse his type 2 diabetes. And he came back in and was half the man he was when he was there. So I was able to do that. And a lot of those people, we live in such a small area. A lot of those people looked me up even after I left there through like Facebook and stuff and have been able to stay in contact. Yeah, I guess just anecdotally, when you worked in a cath lab, obviously people are getting there, getting stents and whatnot, and angiographies and things of that nature. What were the, and did you see any common, like how many of them had super high cholesterol versus low cholesterol? How many of them were diabetic? How many of them had metabolic syndrome? How many of them were obese? What was it? What was the makeup? Again, obviously, is this your general impression, but what did you sure. seem to see? So, what I personally saw in that five years' time was skinny fat people. So, people who on the outside, look like they probably were like 5'8", 5'9", 175, 180 pounds, Mm -hmm. didn't seem to look like they had any kind of issues. But when you look at their medication list, you'd see metformin, actose, you'd see all these different medications for diabetes and high blood pressure. But then when you would do the heart cath, you couldn't necessarily see the visceral fat on the heart, but in open heart, you absolutely could see that visceral fat that was actually encasing the top sitting on the heart, basically. But it was the majority of our people, for one, were actually low cholesterol, especially the LDL. 
And were I they, mean, medi- were they medicated yes. down that level? Okay. So they had, yeah. sounds like yeah. diabetes, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, and then medicated down their cholesterol. Absolutely. And I'm a common sense kind of person. I, the proof's like right there. So I would always say to them, how long have you been on your statin? 35 years. And you've been low fat, you've been this, you've done all these things, and still you're here either getting stents or we're getting ready to prep you to send you to CBOR for open heart. So I would be like, okay, you're doing these things and it's not working. You're still here in our cath lab or the open heart. Something's not right. You've done what you were told. You've taken the medications and it didn't help. The same, doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome is insane. And that's what I would say to them. And they're like, Oh, yeah, that's true. And I'm like, yeah. So that's when they were willing to listen. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. So you said you like saw me on Rogan a while back and decided four, four years ago to embark on a carnivore diet. What prompted that? Why make the change from keto? Well, what I had noticed is I had actually done a week-long elimination of everything but meat doing keto because my nasal allergies were just horrific. I couldn't, it sounded like I was talking through my nose. I just was achy. And I was like, okay, I know I'm getting closer to 50, but this is ridiculous. And I didn't want to end up on that same track as my mom. And I was just scrolling through one time when then I love Rogan. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll listen. And after I listened, I thought, why not? I'm already keto is an elimination diet from the standard American diet for the most part, unless you do the snacks. So why not? Why not go ahead and do this? And I jumped in head first. I'm an all or none personality. So I was like, here we go. And you started doing it. So you started doing it. How did it, how did it go? The first week I also thought, Hey, I'm going to go ahead and do some extended fasting while I'm transitioning, which I would not recommend doing that. I did a five day water and salt fast during my transition And I did have an episode where I went to get out of bed and I wake up and I jump out of bed. I don't take my time. And I ended up on the floor. I did pass out. And I'm sure it was my electrolytes were off. So I, of course, started putting the salt underneath my tongue and stuff. But my symptoms of anxiety, I'm very OCD regimented. That really started to go. I, I wasn't having anxiety thinking about this or that. And I noticed that really quickly. That was one of the first things I noticed. Okay. Uh, Did you have any problems transitioning? Because some people say GI issues or you obviously said you got a a little bit low on sodium or salt. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have any trouble with that. I'm one of those people where fiber and me have never been friends. Even as a kid, I remember living next door to my grandmother and she'd be like, you need to eat the greens. You need to eat this for fiber. And it would actually do the opposite to me. It did not help produce any kind of bowel movements. It would make me constipated. So one of the best things that happened when I actually started this is I became what I call regular for the first time in my life. I never had to worry about it or think about it. Where the ketogenic diet, as, as even as it's still prescribed, is it tends to be fiber rich and a lot of leafy green vegetables mm-hmm. and things like that. I remember when I was doing it, it was big old salads, and I would eat those. Yeah, I would choke them down. I didn't really like them. I, I liked the I toppings, know. but I didn't really like the leaves very much. But I noticed, yeah. and that's one of the things I noticed as well, is when I switched to a carnivore diet, my digestion got a lot better. I, I, I just, I, I just was I'd going accustomed to whatever it was, and I assumed that was normal for me. And yeah, it just became very, you didn't even notice you're digesting food anymore. It was nice to yes. to have that. And so you've been doing it for four years now. How did it differ from you from a ketogenic diet? Did you do? What were the major differences that you found? It was the easiest thing I have ever done in my life because especially the last two years of keto, it was just this craze of trying to make all of your meals look just like the old stuff, like the stuff that you're not supposed to be eating, the cheesecakes, the lasagnas and things that were keto. And the time that it took to put into that and the cost, you're buying all these extra types of ingredients to make things taste the way you remembered them. And I found that when I went carnivore, I was like, oh, let's see, I have to go to the store or go to my local butcher or I deer hunt. So grab the deer meat out. I cook it, I add salt, I drink water, and I'm done until tomorrow. And I was like, 
that's perfect for me because that gives me all this extra time. So that was definitely something I noticed right away. That was definitely a benefit. And now I eat lion, so it's even easier. Yeah, it's definitely, I think the simplest diet there is to do, and it, it takes a lot of the guesswork out and the calculating and the measuring. And you're right, the, the, the ingredients, particularly if you're trying to like keto pizzas and keto desserts and things like that, it becomes, yeah, I think very expensive in, in a way, probably more expensive than carnivore can be. As a nurse, you probably, as anybody that's been, we've been inundated with this, particularly even in the ketogenic realm, even five years ago, people were still kind of like, we're going to limit red meat and it's going to be more of these other things. And, and now there's embracing a little more as, as carnivores got more and more popular. But did you have any hesitation to eat all this red meat? Was it ever in the back of your mind that red meat is bad for me or... No, it, it really, like when I first uh, was doing keto and they were doing like chicken breasts and stuff like that a lot, I don't really like the taste of chicken. I did like bacon. I'll, I'll admit I did like bacon, but I didn't really care for chicken and turkey and things like that. So I always felt better satiated when I ate beef or deer, lamb, bison, stuff like that. So I, I never was concerned about that. And I did have my cardiologist that worked with me. They're like, well, you're going to end up on our table needing a stent. In fact, I had one who offered to give me a free heart cath because he was just positive that I was going to be full of plaque and which I refused to do a, a heart cath. But I said, after I'd been on this diet for just about two years, I did agree to do a cardiac calcium scoring CT mm -hmm. for them. And that turned out into what was the score on that? It was zero in every one of the arteries. There was nothing. Yeah. And, and, and so the cardiologists that were sure you're going to be full plaque, what do they say? I, because the typical criticism is well, you must be full of soft plaque. That's got to be the, that's got to be the key. Did they, what did they come back with that? Or did they just scratch your head or what do they do? They said your father died of at 42 and they had all looked at his postmortem paperwork because I wanted them their opinion of what had happened to his heart. And his was vasospasms. He actually had vasospasms in all of the arteries. And if he'd have been somewhere where somebody could have done a pericordial thump or anything like that or CPR, they probably could have brought him back. But he had no cholesterol in his coronary arteries. And he grew up in Oklahoma on a reservation where he was fed junk. You talk about standard American diet. It was white bread, sugar, and Crisco was the main staples that was sent to them. Yet he had no plaque in his arteries. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to eat meat, which has this fat that they say is so scary that we're supposed to be afraid of, yet we've made it as a species this whole time up to the last 150 years where it was primarily had to be what you had around. And so I just, I can remember talking with them and, and when they saw my coronary artery score, they were like, oh, Huh. And I was like, yeah. In fact, I kept getting called from the radiologist thinking that they had my birthday down wrong because I was born April 7th of 71. And they thought they were looking at somebody in their 20s. Um, and actually, the last radiologist I talked to was from India that he works over here now, but he was trained in India. And as he's reading my results off to me, and I told him my birthday, and he was just like, I can't believe that. And I said, let me tell you how I eat. And I said, that'll probably blow your mind too. And when I got done, he says, not actually. He says, I took my medical training in India. And he says, we have a lot more nutrition, holistic practices that are integrated into our teaching. So he wasn't actually surprised. And him and the cardiologist basically said, I guess just keep doing what you're doing because something's working. Yeah. Yeah, I guess when India, I think a lot of that is they practice a lot of the vegetarianism. Maybe they consider diet, but I, I, I doubt they're telling everybody to eat. <clears throat> well, I mean, unless they're in the south of India, I doubt they're telling people to eat a bunch of meat, though, or particularly beef. Yeah. Which and is that yeah. fair? So you said you do some hunting, but what does your diet consist of these days? Is it a lot of beef or what is it mostly? It would probably be 70% beef, 20% deer. And then the other 10% would be lamb, bison. We shoot rabbits, but I don't, I haven't had any rabbit. I've got a few, but I don't really care to even eat them. That doesn't seem like something I want. I really feel my best when I stick to ruminant meat. So yeah, that's I think, my I think diet. Just, you got enough fat in there. So you feel like you got some energy in there. So you initially lost 150 pounds way back in your 20s. Have you managed to keep that off this whole time for these whole 30 some years that you've been doing this? 
Yep. It'll be 33 years this year, the day before Thanksgiving. And I have, I had a pregnancy in that time frame. I had already had my first daughter when I was 20. And so I had my son when I was 25 and I gained, I think nine or 10 pounds. And of course I, he weighed seven pounds something. So I lost that immediately. And I never really had to ever think about weight gain again since then. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. So 33 years, yeah, I, I'd say that's sustainable. A lot of people say it's unsustainable, of course. I've been doing it. So you grew up eating standard American diet. You figured out, give up the white flowery stuff. You have kids. How did you raise your kids? Were you concerned about your kids' diet or did you focus on keeping the garbage out of them? Yes. So they were raised eating and learning how to hunt how to garden, how to can. We coal pack our meats and stuff into jars, which make them shelf stable. So they were raised that way. They did have the occasional treat. Of course, when you go to school, you have no control over what your children are are eating. Um, I did fight and finally got the pop machine taken out of the grade school that um, they were in because I just was like, what is happening? So they were raised eating primarily pretty decent food pretty much whole food. And that was the thing I I just always said to him, I'm not going to make you necessarily eat as strict as I do. Just you eat, see how you feel. And if you feel better eating this way, then do that. I just really was more about trying to stick to whole foods. And I always tell them just pretty much the way God intended it. If you like lettuce and you can go out there and eat a head of lettuce out of the garden without putting anything on it, go for it. I'm fine with that. That's still going to be better than Doritos. And you said your family, your parents had obesity. You had obesity. A lot of people say it's genetic. Kids, obesity problems or none? One of each. So I have my daughter who is 30. She'll be 33. She does have some obesity, but my other son, my son is five foot 11 and a half and weighs 128 pounds. So he's the exact opposite. I will say that my daughter definitely seems to follow the genetic traits of my actual mother. They speak alike. They look alike. They're just everything. So I do think there is a little bit to that, but I also had that. And so I know that by changing their eating style, it could help. She just chooses not to do that now that she's an adult, which is okay. You'll get there, you'll get sick enough, and then you may decide to change. Yeah. Is there a different way, difference between your way your son eats and your daughter eats that, that you could tell or no? Oh, definitely. Yeah. My son is definitely somebody who just automatically always was a faster. He is somebody that always generally ate one meal a day. He's not going to, he's never going to have that plate that has potatoes and greens and meats. He's going to eat primarily meats. He might have a bite or two of a green bean, but that's about it. He's not going to take that in. She definitely has three children. So she thinks financially it's cheaper for her to eat the standard American diet. And so that's what she's found herself doing. Now she does raise chickens She does have a garden. They do some of that stuff as well. But there is a lot of that packaged food, which the only packaged food that's in my house is what my husband eats. And I wouldn't, I would never eat any of those things. So your husband has not joined you on the carnivore journey yet? No, I call him my my little renaissance man. So he eats with the seasons. So during garden time, he is just like eating it directly out of the garden He is meat heavy, fat heavy, but he is somebody that if we go to the grocery store, which is, I just despise going, he's somebody that will grab a package of the cookies and stuff like that. Of course, me being the the nurse wife, I'm always like, let me see that package. Let's read the back of those ingredients. So as we're walking through the aisle, I'm reading maltodextrin. Let's have some hexane wash in there. So he does know what's better, but he's been very fortunate. He's just turned 62 and he has no health conditions that we know of. And he sees the doctor every year. So far he's been okay. Yeah. And and your current, I guess you still, do you still currently have a physician you go see annually or, or no? I do. I, I do go see one once a year. And funny thing is, I saw her last August and she had my labs, of course, and she come in and I'm sitting down and she not really slammed it, but she threw them on the table. And she's, I don't 
don't understand this. How are your labs better than mine? She's like, I've been vegan for 25 years. And I said, that might be the problem. <laughs> and so she looked at my labs. All She had done like a vitamin to see if I was deficient in vitamins and minerals and all the things. And everything was really good. I think my triglycerides, I sent this stuff to you guys. I, I can't remember if my triglycerides were in the 30s, 50s, or 80s. They go between there depending on if I fast when I have my lab work done. Mm -hmm. But we ended up spending my entire hour last year going over her labs, her sicknesses, her thyroid. You could see it was puffy and her hair was breaking off at different levels. And I was like, how's your thyroid? And she's like, it's not very good. So actually, just in December, I got a check back for my copay that I had paid for my office visit, which she told me at the end of my appointment, she was like, I probably shouldn't charge you for your appointment considering we went over my health care issues because she fell at 48 and broke both of her wrists. Oh, vegan, yeah. It's, and we know that there is a higher risk for osteopenia with that sort of dietary. Has she considered changing her? Have you made, all the, made, made her change? I did get her, I did get her to agree to uh, add in at least some eggs because she's like, the poor animals. And I was like, what about the poor animals that die? I live in a community that's corn and soybeans and all this stuff. I see the carnage that happens from all the stuff that they spray and, and just the way they work the ground. And I'm like, you're saying poor animals, but what about the poor bees and the butterflies and the birds and everything else, the snakes and things like that, that are destroyed in your field? I was like, you're killing more of these cute creatures. And she's like, but they're not all cute. And I said, it doesn't matter. They're still a creature. I don't think a cow's cute. I think he looks really good. I think they're tasty, but he has one bad day. So she at least agreed she was going to to add in some eggs and see what she could do and maybe some chicken. And I said, Put a couple pieces of ribeye fat in there with that chicken, at least, if you're going to eat chicken. Yeah, we'll yeah, see. For sure. Good for you. So I guess back to your actual practice when you're seeing home health folks, what do you, is it just just whatever random stuff? Is there a focus on what, and then are you able to, again, yeah. use any of this nutritional knowledge to impact these folks? Yeah. So I, I see everything from people who are young that have had car accidents, surgeries, appendectomies, wound vax. I see IV antibiotics, but the majority of what I see is from your 60 on up to, I have several patients I've seen that are well into their hundreds, 103, four, and five. And those people that are in that age range, they actually eat more like what I would say is ketovore. It's definitely lots of bacon grease and butters and real eggs, stuff like that. And I'm very fortunate because, like I said, I'm in a small community and the doctors here, I, I don't know how to say it without being crummy to them, but they're not very smart when it comes to nutrition at all. So if I call and make a recommendation in my care plan can we work on getting them off a of statin? Can we work on trying to do Redmond's Real Salt? And actually, I have had probably about a 90% where they have been like, okay, we'll try it for a couple weeks, see how their labs do, see if they get swelling in their legs, see if their hypertension gets worse. And then when all of those things get better, they're like, okay, all right, they just concede. So it, it's been pretty good. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I just saw a paper out of Sweden. It was, it was actually published a while ago, but I saw it again. It reminded me of it. And they saw that the for their centenarians, the folks that live over 100, the, and they looked at their blood lork, and the average total cholesterol was quite high. It was like two, between 250 and 270. The, their glucose was quite low, and actually their iron was a little high. So it was interesting to see some of these features that people that live a long time have, in, in, at least in some of these studies, and maybe that goes. Because when I used to see 100-year-olds, as an orthopedic surgeon, all of them were demented old ladies with a broken hip and a diaper that peed on themselves, yeah. and it was just yeah. as 100. So it's good to see that you're seeing at least some of them that are somewhat vigorous, which and, and maybe and clearly diet has an, has an impact on that. Do you, you've been in nursing for whatever, 30 years or so now, you've had to see a, a significant change in the patient populations over time. Are we just getting sick? Clearly we're getting sicker and sicker, but is that, are you seeing more and more of this stuff and, and what, what kind of things have you seen over the years? 
Probably what I have seen the most change is when I first started on the med surge floor, the average person that would be in their 60s was new to diabetes. They were like, oh, you need to do diabetes education, show them how to do their finger sticks, how to do their insulin. Before I left that hospital system that's corporate ran in 21, they I was teaching 25 and 30 year olds, how to do those things. And I was like, boy, that's a big difference. Hypertension, fatty liver disease is just off the charts in these younger people and non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver, all kinds of things that are definitely metabolically related. That is probably what I have seen the biggest change. The other change that I have seen is the sheer number of type 3 diabetes, the dementia and Alzheimer's. Those numbers are just skyrocketing and younger and younger. Yeah, it's frightening to think that there are people now becoming symptomatically symptomatic with dementia, maybe in their 50s, some in the late 40s, in fact. And you think about it, if you're a 20-year-old college kid or you're just starting your career, and now mom is demented. What the hell do you do? I mean, it's kind of like, can you yeah. afford it? Can you afford it to stick them in a home or do they have to come live with you? And it's a real, it's a real issue here. And I think, as you mentioned, type three diabetes, a lot of people think that dementia is a brain insulin resistance issue. And that's why a lot of those, a lot of those people start craving sugar really badly because they're trying to fuel their brain, which is hard to get that energy there until they just overwhelm themselves with sugar, which has these other downstream consequences as well, I think. What, as far, again, do you deal much with dementia patients? Is that part of your purview? And do you find, what do you see about their dietary habits? Do you see anything interesting about that or do you get to get into that? Yeah, it's exactly like you say, when you go into their home and you see their counter in their kitchen, just full of cakes and cookies and little Debbie snacks. And it's just, it's appalling. Sugar, sugary drinks, all the different types of pop hard candies. And I've been fortunate to work one of the nursing homes. We had an Alzheimer's unit and we were very fortunate that it was a Methodist church ran nursing home. And so it wasn't governed. We had a medical doctor over it, but we weren't so tightly governed at that time for like dietary stuff for them. And so we, we started doing coconut oil Uh, making bulletproof coffee and bulletproof teas for them, adding in real butter. I would bring things from home on my weekends that I would work and have them like do an activity of making those kind of things for themselves, like making ghee. We did ghee one time and we saw a significant change in the progression. I won't say that I can't say that I saw anybody totally reverse that, but I will tell you that the ones that you could systematically see them declining just right before your eyes, that was not, that wasn't there anymore. It was more of they're making better sense. They could remember short-term things because I could see them for three days, be off work for two days, come back to work. And I was a brand new person every single time. And after we would do like a lot of the coconut oils and different things like that, MCT oil was another one that we would do. They would be like, oh, I'm so glad you're back. How was your daughter? How was deer season for the weekends that I'd be off for deer season? And they were starting to remember some of those things, which I was like, that's wonderful because that was so hard for families to come see their loved one and, and they didn't know who they were. And so I did have some families that were like, hey, Not only does grandma know who we are, but she wrote down some of those old family recipes that we wanted, which were probably bad recipes. They were going to be not good for their health, but it was something that they wanted to keep in the family. And they were like, she remembered. So that was pretty unique to see that. Yeah. I know like dementia, I know not to get political, but I know people are talking about dementia and, and whether yes. the president's demented. And it's interesting that he, he mm-hmm. seems to always be eating ice cream. It, it's almost like a, it's, is, is that a real issue for what's going on there? What, as far as your, I guess you're back to your health, you, you don't have any health issues, right? Basically you're doing pretty well, right? Yeah. I, and I, I was born with asthma. So I do still have asthma. I do take a medication. Uh, it's called the Offlin. It's an old World War II drug. It's been around for a while. They don't want me to be on that medication. Of course, they want me on the newest, more expensive thing, but I I fight and stay on that. 
So I take that. And then otherwise, I do take some supplements because the type of workouts. I do a lot of kickboxing, rebounding, sprinting, lifting weights, stuff like that. So I do deplete when I feel like my magnesium does drop because I'll get leg cramps. So I, I do some of that. But yeah, as for health, I went through menopause when I was 52 and 51, 52. And it was, I had one night of hot flashes. And in my family, the women go like 10 years of having just miserable symptoms. And so that's what I expected to happen. And that's not, I think having the increased fat and I'm somebody that almost does a 50, 50 ratio. Like you say, I don't weigh anything, but if I'm going to have a giant burger patty, there's going to be that same amount of ribeye fat that I have cut up and I've crispy fried that. And I'm going to have that. And I think that really has helped. So no acne. I retain muscle uh, very well. My bone density improved to the point where they're like, we don't even need to see you again unless you fall down and break something. I had three vertebrae in my back when I was 28 that I had compression fractures from a rollover car accident. And that's when I started taking uh, K2D3 based on it was a um, Indian doctor that was here in our community. And I had been taking calcium and he said, throw it away. It's going to end up in your arteries and around your different organs. And uh, he had talked about the K2D3 and I did that. And yeah, I've never had another fracture. And I promise every year during deer season, I end up on the ground. So I, if I'm going to break something, you would think I would have. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And we see, I, I, I see as an orthopod, I used to see a lot of people just minor, they'd trip over their dog or something like that. And they would shatter their, they would have a distal femur fracture, a shoulder fracture or something, proximal humus fracture. Yeah. And it's amazing how frail people can become very rapid, particularly women, particularly after menopause. It's, it's a real issue there, particularly if you're not getting enough protein in that. I actually, yeah, I actually, when I was 50, I was deer hunting and I shot one deer and I field dressed her. That's just taken out the organs and drug her up a hill. And like 20 minutes later, I shot another doe and I did the same thing. And I went to drag her up the hill and my Achilles on my right leg, I did a three quarter tear. It sounded like a rubber band snapping and it felt like somebody had shot me in my leg. <laughs> it was horrible. And I couldn't walk up the hill front ways. I had to walk up it backwards. I couldn't do lifting the toe. And I went to see an orthopedic doctor down at the hospital where I was working. And I was like, do you think surgery? What do you, and he's no. And I said, I'm just over 50. I'm like, is this happening because I'm 50? And he said, no, it's happening because you don't sit on your ASS on the couch. He says, those people never tear a tendon or hurt themselves because they're not doing anything. I integrated several seven day fasts and started really making my own bone broth and gelatin stuff from the bones and eating the ends of the bones during that time. So I injured myself November 19th and December 24th, I was walking on my treadmill again. And one of the things I've seen, not only just as, as a surgeon, I, I think diet plays a significant role in your pack capacity to heal. And I think we see people like you'll do nutritional screening on people, particularly look at like a serum albumin and if it's low, they have a hard time healing and that has maybe might indicate protein status in some way. But for sure, I've seen people within this carnivore community have injuries, life happens, you break bones, you don't get lacerations and they heal very rapidly, at least it seems so. Do you, it's interesting you're out there, you said you're sprinting and lifting and those are, and I'm obviously, I'm a huge fan of all that stuff. Huh? So good yeah. on you for doing that. And that's something, is that relatively new for you or had you done that ever since you were in your twenties? No, I did absolutely zero exercise. I was actually a factory worker for 10 years. I, I built semi-trailers for five years and then I worked at a food factory for five years. So I did a lot of walking on concrete, just constantly moving. Working at a food factory in the United States was very eye-opening. That was an education in itself. But I didn't start exercising until I was 39. And it was on a dare from my son because he says, yeah, you're healthy because I was doing kickboxing and stuff. But he says, I can outrun you. And I was like, well, your school bus doesn't come for another 30 minutes. Let's go try. 
And so we took off. We lived out in the country at the time. We took off on the blacktop. And next thing I know, I'm at a bridge that's a mile away. And I turn around and my son's nowhere to be found. And I go running back and he's dry heaving on the side of the road. And I was like, look at that. I could do it. And then after that, that, that bug hit me and I started doing that. But I have found in the last few years that I feel better if I do the sprinting versus doing long distance running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like doing sprinting of various types, whether it's on a bike or a rower or running up and down my driveway. It's got a big, long, steep hill, about almost 80 meters. So I like doing those. So let me ask, are, are you, so do you participate in the social media madness? Do you do any of that stuff? I do. I do. Yeah, actually on you. And I had been on YouTube before years before doing this. I did some keto cooking on Facebook, different things like that. But I had been on there, but actually I'm with a group of ladies. We call ourselves the Fierce Felines, and we're on every Monday. It's called Meaty Mondays. And we were just basically broadcasting kind of different ideas and different things that that revolve around mostly carnivore, ketovore. We've got carnivore news you can use. We have a gal that, that does a little segment on that, which has been really interesting. You definitely, your name definitely comes up, Dr. Barry, Dr. Avadia, Dr. Hampton, mm -hmm. Cha Chaffee, all of those names. But yeah, we do that a lot on social media. And then I do a lot of cooking videos. I haven't so much done exercise because when I do my exercise, it is like hardcore and I'm like, they're not going to be able to hear anything I say. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I get that. It's tough to film when you're exercising or at least to narrate. So fierce feline. So this is an interesting thing because it's, I think that today, even though there's been a lot of greater and greater acceptance among carnivores, among the female members, it still skews a little bit more male. I'd say maybe 60, 40 is my, my best guess. But do you find that a growing number of females are, are actually adopting this? I do. And just the people that reach out to me, because on like when I go on YouTube, I have my personal um, email there because a lot of people don't want to ask those questions publicly. So I, I've had a lot of women anywhere from 25 to I've got an 80 some year old that reached out to me recently and they're very inquisitive of, I want to do this. I want to try that. I have this disease going on. I'm on this medication. And I'm always like, I am not a doctor. I am a nurse. This is what I would recommend, but go talk with your doctor. If they're not agreeable, sometimes you have to find a new doctor. And it's not that you want your doctor to do everything just because you say so. But I don't like it when they just look at you and say, no, because I said, don't do that. Don't do it. It's never, this is the reason behind and it makes good sense. Yeah. So I do see a lot more females getting out there and seeing like everybody looks better. We're not wrinkling as bad. And not that I care because I don't care. I'm going to look like what I'm going to look like. But you just feel better. Your sleep is better. Your hormone levels are better. People with anxiety, depression, that's gone compared to what you have when you're eating the junk. So I think they're starting to see those benefits on so many people that they're like, oh, okay, maybe I could do this. Yeah, it's it's important because when we look at nutritional decisions made for households, it's still moms tend to or women tend to make the, the nutritional decisions, even still, even though it's we're in 2024 and we've got more diversity of what, what people do. Yeah, still most of the grocery shopping decisions are made by the women in the family, a lot of the cooking still. So it's important that we get as many women on board as possible, I think, so what about so the social media how has it been received is it are you said youtube maybe facebook positive negative mi mixture of both i really have had probably 99.9% .9 positive until one of your videos with the crazy oh. vegan that wants us to jump off of the planet here i made a comment on on your post and who I don't know if it was him. I don't know which one of the little, I call them rainbow warriors. That's just me. And I was like, whoa. And yeah, I got hit pretty hard. And I was like, you want to discuss science? I love science. Let's have that discussion. And I can go toe to toe. Some of them I'll go toe to toe with. I've had pictures of like my deer, like where I, because I process my own. We do all of our own stuff. 
And I, I showed that on a Facebook because you can't ever show that on YouTube or they'll freak out. But I showed that and this lady was just like, oh, that poor animal. And, and, and she actually wasn't a vegan, but she was like, she goes, she goes, well, you killed them. And I was like, do you eat meat? And she was like, I do. And I was like, an animal was on a hoof or a wing or at some point when you're eating that, something had to die in order for you to survive. I said, I, I just believe that's the reason animals were put on the planet for us to survive. And I, I said that we're at the top of the food chain for a reason. But yeah, I definitely got hit pretty hard by that fella or one of his cronies on that video of yours. Mm, yeah, it's been fun. I, I've, obviously, I've been dealing with this stuff for years. And I just, most of it's just comedy to me. I don't really take any of it serious, to be honest, because they, they're just, they can't be serious people if they believe what they believe, in my view, or, or at least they're very much misguided for sure. So let's see, we got a few more minutes left. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we, we wrap things up? I just wish that there was a way, and this is just goes back to the doctors, unfortunately, have to follow this standard of care, which is written by our legislators and ran by like your big corporate ran hospitals. I wish that there was just more options out there for metabolic teaching for our, our physicians, because I think a lot of them, if they were taught to think both sides, I think that would be a better marriage than only everything has to come from a pill. I wish that there was some way that we could do that. And I think studies coming out will help guide that stuff. And I think like what you guys are doing with Rivero and things like that, and there's some other ones that are out there. I think that's great for people to have that opportunity to be able to get healthcare. Common sense healthcare is what I call that. It's use your brain type stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's really what I wish. Yeah, well, like I said, we're doing we're we're trying to make it happen at Rivero, and I know there's a couple other groups that are that are doing something similar. So uh, I think we're going to see. I think there'll probably be a two tier type of thing, and some people will go this way, and some people just want the pills. And and if they if that's all they want to do, hey, good yeah. for them, good luck. It's not my particular preference, and hopefully, what we can do is is do that. So anyway, on social media, because somebody was asked they couldn't find the fierce felines or whatever. What are the handles where people can go? On YouTube, it is at Healthy Carnivore. Mm -hmm. On Facebook, it's Laura P. Russell. I will. I just always tell people that if you go to Facebook and you can't find me, I do get in Facebook jail quite often. Then on X, I am Laura R U four seven seven one. Pinterest, I have a lot of recipes that are carnivore. It is L P R U S S E L L. And then on, let's see, on Rumble, I'm Patriot LR. So that's the majority of where they can find me. And then the Meaty Mondays, each of us that are on the panel, um, share that to our pages. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Laura. It's been a pleasure chatting with you and continued success. Looks like you're doing great. Great. Thank you so much for having me here. I like to spread the word. Yeah, thanks.